enlighten us on your path? Well, um, I had a traditional PhD in clinical psych, um, and I went to Esalen with some friends um, who were going to a couples workshop, and they were afraid that something would go wrong, and they asked me to come. And there was a spiritual healer at Esalen. Esalen is a new thought kind of center in Big Sur, California. So um, this woman that was leading the group asked me to do a spiritual healing with her on a woman who was blind. And I had never done spiritual healing. I didn't know anything about it. And so we started, and the room got really hot. And the woman became sighted. And her mother had um, a congenital, same congenital issue with her eyes and had gone blind at the same time. So it caught my attention that um, spiritual healing was the answer, not really psychology. Psychology could name the problem, but couldn't really fix it. And so that sent me on a whole new journey of finding out about spiritual healing, which is really just channeling the Holy Spirit of God. From, it's not from a religion, it's more from gathering an energy, and that energy has consciousness on it, and the consciousness changes the consciousness of the person you're applying it to, and that causes them to change. So that's what causes cancer to go away. It, um, I worked with the National Institute of Health in Washington, D.C., and they did a study with me that's now probably 16 years old. And they gave me the name of a person, and that this person was located in Washington, D.C. It was a triple blind study with a psychiatrist and a therapist and myself. And I was supposed to apply spiritual healing whenever I wanted to, but it wouldn't be known by the therapist or the psychiatrist when I was doing this, so that there couldn't be any prediction of outcome. And they even changed the name of the woman and didn't tell me they had done that. So they lied to me about the name, and I still found this person, and I did spiritual healing over a year. She was bipolar, and she had had electroshock therapy and all kinds of um, therapies and none of it had worked and all of a sudden she started to get better and she got way better and um, it turns out she was a head nurse at Sibley Hospital in Washington DC and I got to meet her and she has never had any problems since then. Um, IONS Research Institute in uh, Petaluma, California, did a study, not that I like this, um, but they did a study with mice, and they put cancer on the mice, and then they had healers heal the cancer. And what they discovered is that if they put a patch of cancer on the mice again, the mice that had been healed, it didn't stick. So somehow when you meditate or do any kind of spiritual dance or any kind of spiritual work, you get filled and it changes the cells of your body and makes you less vulnerable to illness. And so that study is now being published. So that it pays to do the things that you've been doing is really what the truth of the matter is and that it can keep you very well. So then um, I started meditating with the idea of information in the New Age system was sort of old, and it was the same thing over and over again. So a couple of doctors, MDs, um, and myself decided to um, have a Tuesday night meditation where we asked for the presence of Harry Edwards, who is a very famous healer in England, in Cher, England, that died, I think, in the 80s. And um, so none of us knew 
do anything about mediumship. So we got all of the Time Warner books on mediumship and read them and had the idea, okay, we're just going to try this and see if it works. And the first night, what all of the books said is you could sit for 30 times before you get an energetic difference. We sat the first night and had an energetic difference. And that group is still going on. That was 1993. We still do it every Tuesday night. Wow. And um, we have the oldest rabbi, female rabbi, in the world in that group. Um, none of us are aging in the same way that average people age. It's um, sort of weird. I mean, because Leah is probably eight, just about 89. She still swims every day. She drives a car. She sees clients. I'm going to be 72 in December. No. Yeah. And, um, and, and some of the other people who have been in that group um, are in their 60s and early 70s. And we're just noticing none of us have the signs of aging that average people have. It's weird. You know, it's weird, but it's real. And so, because we've been doing this almost 30 years now, we're really seeing the differences or what the outcome is. It's concrete. So, um, then I started leading meditation groups in Washington, D.C. for psychiatrists and psychologists to try and help them realize that their intuition had more validity in the work that they would be doing than their education. And um, so I would go around a room of psychiatrists and tell them, and there would be social workers and psychiatrists who see the same patients. And so I would describe their patients to them, what the problems were. And they'd start giggling because a couple of them there was witnesses that what I was saying was true because a couple people would be working on the same person. And so I would go around the room like that. But then it didn't catch on. They didn't really get, even from a demonstration like that, that their own internal self was a better working unit than their education. They still couldn't get it. Um, so I've been doing that for about 25 years. And I cut back to once a year, once or twice a year I go now. Um, and essentially, I'm doing what I do in the Tuesday night group. And um, it really works. It helps people really quickly make changes because your consciousness has a vibration, and if you want to make a change, you've got to change your vibration to have a different consciousness. So you can't learn it. You have to gather it. It's the difference of sort of male energy out going for a book versus the female energy that's sitting and receiving. So if you want to make a change, you actually have to sit and receive not project your own energy out. So I have a business card, I can show you that. Um, <clears throat> that I've had for um, 40 years, the same card. And it's Horus, which in Egyptian, um, languaging, Horus announces the king, but the wings are in the shape of a chalice. So it's announcing that the king, the, the spirit of God, has to fill the chalice in order to get change. So I thought the best thing that I could do is do a Tuesday night group. Do a Tuesday night meditation and let you feel the healing energy. That's tomorrow, isn't it? Pardon me? Today's Tuesday. Today's Tuesday. Today's Tuesday. Yes. Now. Just now. Yes. 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 Yes.
because I think that's the real answer to this. And I think this is what Mary Magdalene did with Jesus. She knew from inside herself the power in the man that she was with. And the only way to really feel that power is to be able to feel it inside yourself. And then to recognize this is different and better or a higher vibration than what I have when I'm doing my normal life. And then that begins to make you search for that power again and again and again because it relieves the pressure of everyday life. And I think that's why she stuck with him, even though it was a very difficult journey. Is that there was some...
So allow yourself to breathe and feel this healing love, divine love, filling your chest, your emotional heart. Releasing the wounds of the past. Releasing any trauma. And allowing the heart to be filled with divine light that actually opens the chest so that the ribs feel wider the chest feels wider as the wounds of the heart are lifted from you. such as Mary Magdalene. And as we ask for Mary Magdalene to be in this room, you will feel the vibration shift from divine love in the Holy Spirit to divine feminine love. And you will feel the lightness, but also the strength. And we ask that this feminine strength and divine presence fill your heart in the center of your chest and feel the difference as the divine feminine places her hand on your chest allowing the flow of divine grace Filling your chest, your body, filling the cells of your brain, balancing the chemistry of your brain, and again the warmth in the center of your chest. Feel the quiet. quiet love, filling the cells of your body, and this quiet love 
fills the veins and the blood of your body, cleansing the blood of all toxins, moving through the spine to the base of the spine. Take a moment to memorize this difference, how full you feel, how empty of trauma you feel, how full of possibility you feel. Memorize this state of quiet and divine union with your heart. A divine union that lasts forever and that draws towards you this healing gift of light and divine love. Just by awareness of this presence within you, you can reignite this healing vibration. And now imagine you are walking a path into your immediate future. And the path is full of divine life. And you walk into divine life. And as you do, what you need from the world is provided. What you need from the divine in information and direction is provided. Feel this now as you see yourself in a field of light, in a field of divine love where you are the child of the divine, provided for and guided to have everything you need to be creative. Memorize yourself in this life. Youthful, healthy, and creative like never before. Things come to you easily. 
What you need to know informationally is present with the need. There is no time. What you need and the information is instant. You are in divine presence. And see yourself holding divine presence inside yourself, in the cells of your brain, in the clear blood of your body, in your lungs that hold fresh oxygen, filling your body with strength and allow your spirit and soul to feel the connection to the divine as permanent in this moment. Your spirit and soul are in charge of divine love and divine light in a permanent merging within you. And feel the fullness of this truth in this moment. And see yourself Carrying this into all of your future. Into all of your future. Into all of your futures. In all time. This is who you really are. This is your true self. People say they saw Jesus here. I think what they saw is the manifestation of Jesus that Mary Magdalene could call in from the same energy anytime she cared to see him. And other people saw him.
I've studied meditation for many years, like you, mm -hmm. and sat at the feet of many meditation teachers, you know, from different lineages, Buddhists, Hindu, yogis. I used to know an Anglican vicar in Stroud who used to do a silent meditation. So he didn't do the what you were doing, the talking over. Every Friday night, mm -hmm. for an hour and a half, he had a room built next to his church and lit candles, it was a white carpet, and he just came and sat. You know. um, I've done Quaker meditations and so on. And I've learned some of more of them, also Sufi meditations and Kabbalistic, and mm -hmm. sometimes Kabbalist talk, you know, taking through the set of mm -hmm. and so on. I just wonder what have been the influences on you in your <coughs> meditational journey? How do you come to this? It's been more personal. Right. Um, and I think it came out of, I knew there was information about healing but I knew I wasn't finding it in any books. And so, naively, I decided Harry Edwards, who was a very good healer of cancer and lots of um, frozen spines and different things like that. So I figured he was a good place to start. And, um, but when I was little, I remember in grade school telling my classmates, a, a classmate of mine told me this recently, I was hearing Mary talking to me, and she was telling me that the Catholic Church was going to stop this idea that you had to eat meat on, you had to eat fish on Friday, and that you could actually eat anything you wanted. And so I told at a slumber party my little friends that Mary was talking to me, and that she told me this, and they told me I was sacrilegious because it was a little Marymount school, and so they decided I was sacrilegious. And um, and then it was only a couple months later the Catholic Church made this proclamation, and they all kind of went, "Whoa, wait a minute." Um, so I think I've always had a mediumistic ability, and I trained with Native Americans. I've done all sorts of stuff, and. It just, the only thing that didn't have a negative feedback loop was going straight to the divine, going straight to the Holy Spirit. And um, because Native Americans get into psychic warfare and all kinds of stuff, I wanted something that was really simple. <coughs> and this is really simple, but it's powerful. And you can feel it. Um, and so that's it. I just... I just like simple and powerful. Okay, that, that's great. Thanks for answering my question. Oh, I've got others, but let some of us venture forth. My way of how does one become a spiritual... What's your title? Um, um, well, it depends on... Yes, yes. Yes, how does one become that? Um, part of my part, in my late twenties, I had a conversation with God, one of the first ones, and He told me what I can do. Yes. And I denied it. And here we all are. So I'm wondering, how did you, or how does one, any one of us, become a spiritual metaphysicist? or um, something. I think that what, mm. what you have to realize 